Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Public Safety Committee meeting of uh, October 30th, 2023. Today we actually have two topics. The first is the juvenile justice uh, uh, topic, um, and the second one is it, juvenile justice crime and public safety issues, and the second is a work session on the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services. We'd like to invite the panel, please, from the juvenile justice uh, panel to please come forward and sit with us as they're coming forward and we see that Chief Jones is here as always chief it's good to see you and others not just Chief Jones and and the uh, state's attorney John McCarthy is with us as well and um, what I plan on doing is um, I'm going to ask the panel once they're settled in here to introduce themselves and then I'm going to ask uh, the, uh, the uh, council member Lukey who asked for this briefing to give her thoughts on it and then ask council member Mink if she has any openings ask the panel if they have any openings and uh, remarks and then ask Ms. Farag to lead us through this packet uh, once again I want to publicly thank Ms. Farag who did both pa uh, packets uh, for this topic and the next one and uh, we thank her for once again doing an extremely good job and on the second packet uh, Logan Ambinder was uh, in a, got an assist on that one as, as well so with that um, would the panel please introduce themselves and we can start on my right uh, please Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Joseph. I'm proud to be a public defender in Montgomery County. I've been a public defender representing children for more than 20 years. I'm also a proud member of AFSCME Local 423, the Maryland Defenders Union, um, and an MCPS graduate and MCPS parent. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mark Yamada, Assistant Chief of Police Field Services Bureau. Good morning. I'm Carlotta Woodward. I'm the Chief of the Juvenile Division in the State's Attorney's, uh, State's Attorney's Office here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Morning. My name is John McCarthy. I'm the State's Attorney for Montgomery County. Good morning. Marcus Jones, Chief of Police of Montgomery County. Good morning. Jordan Stinsky, Captain, Charge of our Community Engagement Division for the Police Department. Good morning. Lisa Gary, Deputy Secretary for Department of Juvenile Services, Community Services. Thank you. Yes, please. We know who you are, Ms. Farrar. Susan Farrar, Farrar Council <laughs> Staff. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for being on Council Staff. We welcome all of you, and thank you for being with us. And with that, I'm going to turn to Council Member Lukey, please. First off, I want to thank everybody for being here today and, um, and, and for the focus on the information that was presented in the packet, which helps to frame things um, very well for today's discussion. Um, I know this is a hot topic, not just here in Montgomery County, but across the state, and that there are efforts afoot to try and figure out how to best deal with this problem. Um, and I and I want to just shape this because I you know I hear different discussions whether it's happening in Annapolis or happening in different communities. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we're focused on the fact that the fact that the juvenile justice system exists in the first place is to be an intervention, that there are multiple avenues within the juvenile services um, agency to get children assistance. Um, and so, you know, we have couple of different tools obviously there's child in need of assistance and a finding of delinquency which is where a child if they engage in an act that could have been considered a crime if completed by an adult um, is adjudicated uh, delinquent but we also have a provision called child in need of supervision which does not require an underlying delinquent act um, or finding in that way so a child in need of supervision is a child who requires guidance treatment or rehabilitation and is required by law to attend school and is habitually truant or is habitually disobedient ungovernable and beyond the control of the person having custody of him or deports himself so as to injure or endanger himself or others or has committed an offense applicable only to children again that does not involve a finding of delinquency it does however involve finding that the child is in need of some extra services and support um, and that is a mechanism by which to obtain 
help for children. It's also a chance, and I've heard this discussion coming up repeatedly as these issues are being discussed across the state, a mechanism and an opportunity and time to see what else the child may need in terms of their educational placement and other resources that they may need. Because again, we're talking about children. They do need to receive their education. We are trying to make sure that at the end of the day, whatever interventions are done are there to help them not to do these things when they are adult, to help them transition to life as a successful adult. Um, however, we are experiencing, uh, I, I would say it's a small number of juveniles who are doing a large number of things out in the community um, where they are repeating conduct. And so the question is, what intervention are they getting or not getting um, upon the first offense because we're seeing cases where they offend, they may be caught for the offense by law enforcement, and then they are back out um, within a day or two doing exactly the same thing. Um, in particular, last winter in my jurisdiction, or sort of it started partially in mine and then ended in, in Councilmember Mink's um, district because our border is right there, the same young juvenile robbed stole three cars in six weeks. He was apprehended each of those times. He was asked, they were asked to um, hold the child and he was not held. The third time he did have a firearm with him. It resulted in a lockdown of a nearby elementary school while they deployed different tactics to get him. And it was only after that third time in six weeks that there was any kind of a halt because he was finally held. And so I would love to be able to focus on where we are seeing from each different lens within this system, where we are seeing the hiccup in the system. Because at the end of the day, if the child is not being matched to services or interventions or um, you know, for those cases which are felonies, being having the actual petitions referred by DJS to the state's attorney's office and being prosecuted and held accountable in that way, then they are not learning from that, right? So that's that's my goal here today is for us to probe that in greater detail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Bank. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Lukey for calling for a session on juvenile justice uh, and thank everybody for being here today for an important conversation. Um, as we know, the um, you know research research shows and as the department of uh, as the DOJ office um, office of uh, juvenile justice and delinquency prevention has noted. Uh, there is a lot of research that shows that diversion programs that redirect youth away from the justice system as early as possible in the juvenile justice process, while still holding them accountable for their actions, of course, is associated with a decreased likelihood of recidivism, avoidance of stigmatization and labeling, decreased criminal justice costs, and an increased perception of fairness by the victim compared to traditional justice processing. Um, we also know that the state law recently passed was based on a multi-year research effort conducted by a bipartisan group, including experts from Annie E. Casey, the Fair Institute, and many, many more. And we also know that there are many issues that we're seeing cropping up, many of which have existed for many years, and some which have gotten worse post-pandemic, including juveniles who are reoffending, juveniles being held in adult facilities, and underuse of virgin programs. So. I'm glad that we are all here today to come together, learn more about how we can do better to address some of these shortcomings. Thank you. And before I go to the panel, I, I too want to very publicly thank Councilmember Lukey for bringing this to us for a discussion. We hear about the school to prison pipeline, and and we need to make certain that the resources that are needed for that young person is are there so that there is no school to prison pipeline. And to the points of, of my colleagues already, we cannot pretend that by doing nothing, that nothing is the solution. We need to make certain that, that this puzzle fits together. We need to make certain that that young person that is having difficulty gets the resources that they need so that they can become the, the, oh, the citizens that we want them to be, all the, the, uh, the young people, the, the people that we want them to become. And with that, I'm going to ask the panel if they have any opening uh, discussions, and then I'm going to go to Ms. Farag to see if she has anything. 
I had a feeling you might. Uh, I, I just have a few comments. Mr. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think that there are a number of different ways in which uh, sort of dealing with this issue intersects both at the le state and the local level. Uh, I, I can tell members of the town just to begin this that we we have met as recently as three or four days ago with representatives of governor's office. We I've, I've been participated in five or six hour hearing before the Senate, uh, the House uh, uh, delegate, House of Delegates. Uh, Luke Clippinger, because what they're doing is they're looking back, because quite candidly, I think they've now realized that some of the things they did in the juvenile justice package has created some issues that they did not anticipate. And I think that there is a movement from within the governor's office, as well as from in the state, and I have met individually with uh, Will Smith uh, and, and, the, and the vice chair of, of the Senate thing. So I think there are moving parts where a lot of, I think there's interest at all levels of government to deal with this. Uh, look, the ultimate, the ultimate challenge, I think, and this may be one of the things we see coming uh, out of the highest office in, in our state, is the juvenile justice system, I, I think, is broken. It, it is broken because there are not programs for kids. Uh, the simple example is that we don't have a single inpatient drug treatment facility in the state of yeah. Maryland for anyone in the state, uh, and we haven't had one since 2019. I think it was Mountain Manor when it closed. Uh, inside the numbers, uh, I, I saw this, and look, Ms. Frog is, is, is superb, and I, I always value everything I get from Susan. She's terrific. But, uh, you know, the idea that there is <clears throat> some discrepancies within the numbers, the numbers tell you a story if you actually know how to read the numbers. The bottom line is violent crime is up in, in all the areas that the community, and again, people care about all forms of crime, but whether you're talking about carjacking, whether you're talking about motor vehicle thefts, whether you're talking uh, about guns in our community, those things are off the charts. Violent crime among young kids is up, that's no dispute. When you look at the numbers where they're down, and, and this is a disservice, because th these are the numbers from Montgomery County, and the Chief's probably gonna talk about them, but I just, I look at numbers like larceny theft, maybe shoplifting. Well, that number four years ago was 387 kids. Well, then it goes from 387 to 128. Vandalism goes from 48 to 8. CDS events, basically possession of drugs for kids, goes from 344 to 33. Possession of implements, smoking implements, goes from 300 to 27. Liquor law violations go from 107 to 16. Those were the crimes, by the way, Ms. Mink, that we put into our diversionary program. We wanted them out of the criminal justice system. They're not coming in the front door anymore. They're, and there's a, look, there's a lot of reasons. I, the chief is under enormous pressure because of lack of resources. And I will tell you, I think the men and women in the police department are frustrated because of sort of like the example Ms. Lukely gave, where you arrest somebody for a carjacking one day and you're out there to arrest them again the next day. And, and the, there is a hesitancy with young people. I, I would suggest I'm saying this, this is my own impression for the police to have contact with, with sometimes young people, it's not worth the squeeze because of some of the some of the things that are happening in our community. 25% um, of the kids who, 25% of the people who are arrested for violent crimes in the circuit court of Montgomery County come from outside our county. I've not specifically captured the number, but there is uh, an impact here from individuals outside the crime, adults and juveniles coming here to commit crime. Uh, I do tell you that, that, that there are members of the, uh, the bench in Montgomery County. Several have come to me. They are the juvenile justice judges. They are frustrated with DJS, quite candidly. There might be a po point in time, and I think we're there, where there's going to be a conversation about whether we here lo locally should be doing something for kids, maybe even before they're in the system, mm -hmm. like we did with the FJC. With Mr. Katz, you were actively involved in that from day one. Yeah. I mean, we need wraparound services for kids, and quite candidly, we're at a point where we cannot depend upon the state because they're not carrying their weight, and we're being left. So, uh, and any uh, that that's I, I think there's a lot of challenges, but I wanted to say that thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy. I did want to recognize our colleague. And, uh, Council Member uh, Natalie Feeney Gonzalez, though she is not a member of the committee, this is the most popular committee of all. So we certainly always welcome her. She's gonna. She wants rebuttal on that. We're not going to give her that. But, but, uh, <laughs> you know. And I did want to uh, acknowledge that Dr. Stoddard from the uh, County Executive's office is here as well. Did anyone else on the panel have anything else they'd like to say 
as we begin. If not, what I'm, what I'm going to ask is Ms. Uh, Farag to lead us through to the committee and to those who are not on the committee <laughs> um, and to the panel. If there's a comment that you would like to make as we go through, please just let me know and we will call on you. And if, and if I don't call on you, throw something at me so I'll notice you, please. Please, Ms. Farag. So all three of you and Mr. McCarthy have really covered much of what's in the packet, but I'll just go through it for people who aren't familiar with the juvenile justice system. Um, when a child under the age of 18 commits an offense, that child's generally referred to the state juvenile justice system. And the adult criminal system can be punitive, obviously, in nature, but the juvenile justice system's goal is to focus on the child's need. It's child serving. Um, it's providing support and rehabilitative services, and ideally this provoke um, approach this intervention helps positively reintegrate the child back into society and reduces or even ideally eliminates recidivism. Um, there have been a couple of laws that were passed by the General Assembly, the Juvenile Justice Reform Act of 2002, um, which outlined several material changes to the investigation and adjudication of juvenile offenses. And this new law uh, limits the circumstances under which a child younger than 13 is subject to the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. It also alters the use of informal adjustments um, and whether or not a state's attorney is actually notified. Um, and it also establishes limitations on terms of probation, uh, the use of detention, uh, particularly limiting pre-hearing detentions in certain cases and out of home place placements. Additionally, the Child Interrogation Protection Act of 2022 also prohibits police from conducting a custodial interrogation of a child until that child has consulted with an attorney. In practical terms, that means that child is never interrogated. And so it's not just necessarily about, um, you know, adjudicating that youth, but it's also about finding out other relevant pieces of a crime that has occurred that might impact surrounding public safety. Um, these changes have increased the protections for youth, but also may un unintentionally hinder criminal investigations. Uh, I've got some juvenile um, offending trends for you on page two. Um, there was a DGS recently released a research brief that provides an overview of various measures of statewide juvenile complaints. Uh, notably, juvenile complaints have decreased 51% since FY14, and there is a chart on page three. Um, clearly, that downward trend has reversed since COVID, although it's not yet reached pre-pandemic levels. Uh, between state fiscal year 21 and 23, overall crimes of violence decreased by 17%, but there's variation among the subset of those violent offenses. Robbery dropped 30%, felony sex offenses dropped 22%, and child abuse dropped 67%. However, things like carjackings increased 85%, and handgun violations rose 220%. Auto thefts have also driven much of the increase in nonviolent felony offenses between state fiscal 20 and 23. Auto theft complaints to DGS increased by 65%. Um, there's more data on juvenile offending. Montgomery County has provided data as well on violent offenses um, committed by youth. According to a recent news article before the pandemic in 2019, there were 1,646 arrests of juveniles in Montgomery County. There were just 393 arrests or referrals in 2021, but those numbers have been increasing each year since. At the time the article was published, the county had 690 arrests compared to 699 for all of 2022. Uh, the department has provided updated data now for calendar 2023, and there have now been 845 <laughs> juvenile arrests. Um, that data is broken out on circles one through four. The charts below um, on page five also illustrate where arrest referrals are taking place in the county, the sex and the race of the detained juveniles, and the total arrests and referrals by month. Um, notably, robbery has increased 180, 108% since 2019. It's also worth noting the percentage of robbery arrestees from other jurisdictions has increased from 21% of all robberies in 2019 to 38% in 2023. Let me let me ask a question. I guess I don't know if it's police or Mr. McCarthy, but if if that young person under 13 is not arrested, but create, I, I guess a robbery is considered a crime that they could arrest for. So those statistics would be in there. Is that correct? 
That's correct. It's a crime of violence, so robbery would be a part of that. All right. Shoplifting, is, is that considered? No, it's not. Either as a second-degree assault, a fourth-degree sex offense, when you're talking about first-degree burglaries, car thefts, all of those are not considered crimes of violence, so they would not be able to be charged under the age of 13. And that those numbers are not reflected anywhere? I do not believe so. Please. We, I think it's important to note that even when... Push the button. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's important to note that even when um, children under 13 were being charged with all sorts of crimes, there were a very, very tiny percentage of the number, if, if you look at the um, documents provided, under 3%, um, including theft and second-degree assault, all of these charges. So it's a, a very small part of the overall picture. A, a, a small part of the overall picture of, of arrest is yes. what you're saying? Yes, yes. Yeah, According you. to your numbers. Right, I hear Yes. You. Chief, please. Yes. Um, no, we do not capture those numbers. We've not captured it since the change um, of, of, you know, incidents. We do document uh, said incidents. Um, whether, you know, when you have an individual that's involved in delinquency under the age of 13 who may not be charged, there is documentation, but there we do not capture the numbers about how many numbers that we have. Well, and let me tell you, to, to your point, the, my concern is that even though we say it's a small number, each person is an individual, and if that person that's, is, is not getting the assistance that they need to be getting, then that's a, an issue to me. That's correct, but it's important to note that many of those incidents are happening in school. So theft of an item in school, a fight at school. Okay. So there are interventions that are happening, but they're not police reliant necessarily. They're happening in school. They're getting treatment, mental health treatment in, in school. They're having restorative justice in school, which we don't have through the court system. So they may be in many ways getting better and, and research-based assistance, whereas getting locked up for an 11 or 12 year old could traumatize them forever. I or a so, five year old. So, which we Cass, go ahead, please. So, so if, I, if I could speak to this, and one of the things I, I clearly want to make sure that it's very clear here from the police department side, we are always stigmatized for the fact that simply just by making arrests is the primary focus of what we're trying to do here. And that's not at all the case. What is most important in the mission of the police department, one of the most important goals here, is for us to prevent crimes from happening in the first place. And we have a police department that cares about our community, particularly when it comes to young people. And I care. And I've always cared for the fact, and my record is very clear for those who know me, that know I've been involved in juvenile mentoring programs and prevention is at the top of the list. It's at the top of the list of our department as a mission to prevent crimes from happening in the first place. And most importantly, I think what's important here is an intervention of services that provide for young people who are potentially on the road for delinquent acts in the future. And there are many acts that are occurring in our communities outside of schools that we have seen that involve our young people and no intervention has been taking place um, as a result of where we are today. So I want to make it very clear about where we are because we have been accused of simply wanting to just arrest juveniles as a way of solving the problems of our society. We know that doesn't work. It's never worked. But what has worked is intervention and diversion. And what I'd like to see more of is where we are committed at the youngest age. I don't care if they're eight or nine years of age, but there's things in our society we should not be allowing and making sure that the parents who we've spoken to many parents, which is, a, which is a problem that doesn't exist here because we haven't highlighted that, but literally will come to us as the police department and tell us my child is out of control and I can't do anything about it. And what we have always had a working relationship with the state's attorney's office and DJS is the ability 
to work with them in order to get that child and the parent the help that they need. So I wanted to, to just to make some to some clarify some points here because right away we become the the, the negative here about simply about arrest. And and again, most of the arrests that occur are not even when we i.e. say arrest, and in most people's minds that means putting handcuffs on young people. The vast majority of cases that are involved are arrests on paper which means the juvenile never gets arrested and processed the way that an adult would. And so there has to be clarity and understanding in our community about what that looks like. But there, there are, again, there's an avenue of services that really needs to be out there for our community to make sure young people are directed in a more positive way. Thank you, Chief Ms. Gary, please. Good morning. Um, so I, I, I'm glad to be here. I haven't met many of you. I've been in my position as deputy since June of 2023 this year. Um, and I do want to speak to the fact that um, if we are, if because of the law does not allow for the arrest of um, a youth under the age of 13, unless it's a crime of violence or a felony offense, Let's start with the presumption that arrest by itself, as we all agree, does not resolve the issue. It does not address the issue, although it does create a space for um, community and public safety. But then there's still the intervention that needs to take place. And so I want to be on the record to state that the use of diversion, um, the use of interventions, the use of, of SINs um, um, services, um, and the coordination is specifically what is missing. Um, so one of the things that uh, our Secretary Vincent Chivaldi is very, um, 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 he insists on this whole notion of my kid test. And so one of the things that I and I challenge my staff to think about that my kids test because just because the youth is under 13 does not mean that problem behavior gets ignored. If it was my child I would want X, Y, Z, and unfortunately parents don't always know how to navigate systems to get services, and so one of the things that we understand with the rise in not only the violent crime, but also a rise in um, at behavior that we got, um, leads to a SINS referral, um, we need to be able as an agency, as a, as a state department, to be able to respond strategically and comprehensively. So we have created a new position um, at the point of intake to be an early intervention coordinate, um, coordination so that we have someone who is working with community, working with schools and the police to, ask, to identify and access services. So on our part, what we are committed to moving forward is making sure that those kids who are under 13 and kids who are SINS referrals don't just get treated as a SINS checklist, but we are actually connecting youth and families to services and using more restorative techniques, building up the continuum of restorative services, investing in those restorative practices in the communities and the spaces where we need that. So again, I do agree that, and that we do share the concern about the trends right now, not only for violent offenses among youth, but also for those behaviors that, if they're not addressed, will lead eventually to a delinquent act that is eligible. And we, we're trying to prevent that. Sure. So, thank you. Council Member Mink. Thanks. I just wanted to note that I'm, I'm really hearing a lot of agreement across the panel here. And so I think that is heartening to note. And uh, to Chief Jones's point, I, 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 really, I think I'm hearing that agreement that from everyone here that the goal, the shared goal of all of, uh, all of you on the panel, and not all of us up here, is to connect young people to services and figuring out where is the disconnect? How can we make sure that that is actually happening? Um, I'm not hearing anybody sitting up here saying we wanna lock more kids up. And, and obviously that's not, that's not our goal in Maryland, that's not our goal in Montgomery County. It's about facilitating the best possible process to make, to make that connection and figuring out where the shortcomings are, where we might be um, overlooking opportunities or underutilizing some of those opportunities um, or where we need to build out more of those opportunities that this is, a, this is a problem solving moment for all of us to come together and find where those gaps are and see how we can fill them. So I just want to note that for the record that it, it sounds like we all have the same goal and this is a problem solving moment and so that is heartening. And, um, you know, and I will note to um, uh, the, the to the point about um, 
uh, offenses that happen that are referred by the schools or that happen on school property that I think that one is important but it's because we know that the numbers there the percentage is so high uh, and so that's a moment where we want to make sure that we're capturing those kids in the best possible way and making use of the opportunities that we have there because they're within the school system and so you know and, and, and noting also that we have in the packet um, you know, an emphasis on the student, the 12 year old who we know made multiple bomb threats. And um, so I did want to note, you know, I was looking through what options are available for that 12 year old. Um, we don't, you know, because of state law, going through, you know, using an arrest to bring them to DJS and then allow the interventions, you know, to flow from there, um, that's, that's not an option that we have anymore for certain offenses under the age of 13. So where can that moment happen? In the MCPS student handbook, there are uh, many, many, I see you shaking your head, so I'm gonna come to you next. <laughs> um, um, there are, you know, there are three pages of different behavior intervention categories alone. Um, and then there is a matrix of what different offenses are eligible for what different types of interventions. And there are, so looking at that, there are the punitive consequences and there are also connections to services as well. So the possibility is there. So bomb threats, for example, specifically are eligible for the highest level of response, which includes, you know, removal for, from extracurricular activities, uh, referral to alternative education, uh, expulsion, among other things. Um, so if there is a 12 year old who thinks that because of the new state law, they are immune to impactful consequences. Uh, you know, they're wrong, most certainly. Uh, thinking like a 12-year-old, I might say maybe a precocious one. Um, and, and I think that it's going to be important if we want to prevent more of those bomb threats from happening. It's important. We want other 12-year-olds to know that there are impactful consequences waiting for them. So I think that is that is a piece of messaging from all of us. That it's going to be important for all of us to be united in that messaging. We want the other students to know. Maybe there's this new state law, but there are impactful consequences that are, awa that are awaiting you for something like this. Um, there are also, as we've all been focused on, rightly so today, uh, the opportunity to intervene with services. So the interventions that are included for this category include the potential of referring to mental health services, formal mentoring program, community conferencing, uh, different community-based organizations, a functional behavioral assessment and behavioral intervention plan, and more. So if those things are, are, those things are available and supposed to be available through MCPS, which again is what we all want. So if that is, if that's not happening in some kind of, in some kind of way, and I did ask MCPS about this particular case. Uh, they can't comment publicly, obviously, on an, on, you know, an individual student, but they did say that, um, you know, appropriate interventions are being put in place here in regards to this the serious offense. Um, so, you know, but if there are interventions that are not happening, connections that are not being made through MCPS, then that's something, and I know we're going to be talking to MCPS about this stuff coming up, that's something that we need to work on there. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't want to make the mistake of saying if it's not happening properly there, that the solution is to go back and say we need to make it easier to go through DJS for these younger kids. We have the possibility to go through MCPS and to go through the school system. Um, that's where, and the, you know, the state law was changed for a reason. We are all here agreed that the goal is uh, connection with services. So that is a route that we have, and if we need to make that more functional, then we should do that. Thank you. I, I have to tell you that this, and Ms. McCarthy, and I guess Chief Jones, you might have been on this task force as well. About 20 years ago, the gang task force that we had, it was a joint task force from Montgomery County and Prince George's County, and the we came out with prevention, intervention, and suppression. Those were the, the three words. And we knew then, and we said then, and they knew it before, that you can't arrest your way out of these issues. But we also know that if you're going to have prevention and intervention, it has to be the right preventions and the right interventions. And, and you know, I, I always said that, that for a rec, a, a rec department, if we decided to have spend all of our money on ping pong tables and nobody wanted to play ping pong, we had a good heart but didn't have a good result. And that's the concern that I have, is that, yes, we want, no one, we realize you can't and shouldn't arrest your way out of these issues. But that same young person who's making those uh, bomb threats, uh, if, if being uh, that they can't do extracurricular activities from in school, if that's really not going to stop them from making bomb threats, we have to figure out what is. 
So that's my concern. And with that, I'm going to turn to Councilmember Lukey. Uh, since we're on bomb threats, I'll stay on bomb threats. Um, the threats of mass violence, and particularly the social media threats, or threats that get called into schools, it, it's, it's something I've worked on. This is now, I guess, my sixth or seventh year of intense, you know, it's followed me into my policy work here, but it was a deep part of my work previously. And um, I've gone out, I've spoken to kids and parent groups, I've spoken to the statewide PTA on this topic. It is a labor-intensive, resource-draining, public resource-draining episode, primarily engaged in by teenagers and um, middle school students, um, often because they don't want to go to school. Um, and yet it has an intense consequence for the community as a whole. So if you just take the two different individuals over the past two weeks who've engaged in this conduct and you multiply the population of the schools plus their staff and teachers plus their parents and you can see in both cases whether you're talking about the 15 year old or the 12 year old thousands of people were impacted by the conduct of two people now in 2019 the maryland state legislature amended the threats of mass violence statute to include a restitution provision in there so while you wouldn't be able to arrest and prosecute a 12-year-old under current state law, there's a lesson to be learned there about that restitution piece and about having some attachment to the thing you did and the consequence of it to help that child understand better what they did, to help their parents understand what they did and the scope of it, to see the financial impact, the anxiety impact on the community. And that's something I don't see happening. It does happen when the older kids in other jurisdictions and, and, and here are, are um, moved through the DJS system under that threats of mass violence statute. But, you know, a lot of the time there's just no there there. And they may suspend them from school. Um, I know that's available. Um, but when you talk about not wanting to stigmatize a child by having them go through uh, any procedures within DJS, Every other kid knows who did it anyway. There is stigma based on the conduct itself. It's not the fact that a petition goes to DJS or doesn't go to DJS that causes the stigma. Kids spread information like this. Um, I have four school-aged kids in middle and high school. It Word travels fast. Word travels between schools. So we can't let that sort of be the guiding force between why we are or are not doing a particular thing to help break a cycle of conduct or hold a particular child accountable. Um, and we do have restorative approaches in the schools, and that is also a tool that can be used within the, within the judicial system, but it requires the victim be amenable to it, too. Not all victims are going to be okay with saying, I'm going to sit here and have a restorative circle with the person who harmed me. And it's also important to note that referrals that can be given to DJS to proceed with and evaluate don't just come from law enforcement. The schools can write them themselves. The parents of a victim can write them themselves. Community members can write themselves. And sometimes it's the parents of the kids who they want services for directly who are trying to get it through DJS. But what I am concerned with is, and thank you for raising the SINS process in your comments, there's only been one SINS petition in the circuit court for Montgomery County over the past 10 years, and it was in 2014. There have been zero SINS petitions filed in the circuit court for Montgomery County. And as I understand it, the request can be made, the request goes to DJS, but DJS has to determine whether to file the petition or not. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so does DJS track anywhere how many requests for SINs petitions have been made to DJS? Yes, we do track how many SINs petitions have been made, and I can tell you from Montgomery County, what we're seeing in terms of the change between 2019 and 2023 is a 70% 70, 70 reduction in the number of SINs referrals received. Um, but upon receiving the, the SINs, we make a determination whether we will open it, um, refer the services, and again, that's that gap in ensuring that even if we 
we're not going to respond, someone can and should respond, and we can facilitate that, pro help facilitate it, um, that process. Um, but where we find a gap is also informing police or the referring party as to what we did with a SINS um, petition, and that's something that right. we are being accountable for to change that. But we do um, keep a track, uh, keep a record of um, every SINS referral received and what our, what our decision making is about that. And even the ones that we didn't take to the court for adjudication. Okay. So. Well, so but there's only been one. Right. It's been one. Mm -hmm. In 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 a decade, and and for me, you know, I look at that and I think about well, if I'm MCPS and I'm trying to get help, and I know a student needs some extra help. Mm -hmm. For example, it undersins, as I noted at the top of this hearing, mm -hmm. habitual truancy is one of the reasons you can request a sins petition. And, and it is also undisputed that we have astronomical habitual truancy numbers here in MCPS, particularly since the return after the virtual learning environment. And, and you know, there's a philosophy in psychology called learned hopelessness. When you keep trying a thing and it never works and nothing ever gets filed, you stop asking. And so I want to know what happened after 2014 and why was there only one? Because the, the other numbers for 2014, there were 254 child in need of assistance filed and there were um, 2,354 delinquency filings in 2014, but only one child in need of supervision, which technically a child in need of supervision is the low, lowest like immediate thing. It's not a finding of delinquency. It's a, we know something needs to be done. We want to help you and we're going to try and get you services. So why is it not ever being used? And anybody can answer this from your perspectives, anybody trying it, why is it never being used? Please. I think part of the reason with the SINS petition is the teeth that goes into it. So when you have a SINS petition that goes to DJS, it is a voluntary process. So you actually have to get that child in there. They have to want to do those particular services. And I think if the Department of Juvenile Services then sends that to court, what teeth does the court have to do anything? And the reality is it's very limited of what the court can do and cannot do when that petition goes to court. It is a preponderance of the evidence. The Department of Juvenile Services would be the one that would be bringing forth that particular petition. I believe a child has the right to have an attorney mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But then what that judge can actually order is extremely limited. And the reality comes is, is that what if that child doesn't do that? What, what are the consequences then or what are the repercussions of a child not following the judge's order? And I think that that's part of the issue. And I can tell. Um, the council exactly what's going on just as an aside with some of the new laws is we're mm -hmm. seeing that issue with probation yeah and we are seeing it with children who are committing technical violations of probation then law now says if you're on probation for a second degree assault and you are not following your probationary terms the court is limited in what they can do the court right. cannot detain the court cannot commit so if you have a child who has a drug problem who needs to be removed from the community, the court absolutely cannot do that. If they have mental health, the court cannot remove them from the community to give them the services that they may desperately need. Right. And I think that that's some of the issues that we are seeing. And so, and, and to that point with you know what the court can say, you should be referred for this type of mental behavioral health care, <laughs> you should be referred to this because you have a substance use disorder and we wanna get you care. And, and um, the court can't mandate that, but the court is directing the parents or guardian, in theory, to obtain those services for the child. Isn't it considered child neglect if you refuse to get your child needed medical care? I think it can be, and I think you're talking about a child in need of assistance, which obviously my office does not deal with. That would be the county right. attorney's office. Right. But then you have to, is it rising to the level that they're actually going to file a petition for a SENA? Right. Typically when my understanding, obviously not practicing in that particular area, is that it really is significant abuse and neglect of a child is when you're going to have a petition that's filed. I'm sure it is possible. I just can't speak on how the county attorney's right. office does right. with respect to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now that was helpful. Um, in terms of the complaints that I've heard related to individuals who are arrested, 
juveniles and then released to home immediately. Um, and then redoing the same conduct, re-engaging in the same conduct habitually. What, what is DJS's evaluation process for determining whether or not to hold a juvenile? So currently we continue to utilize the detention risk assessment instrument as an objective means of screening for a youth's risk of not appearing for court or risk of reoffending while awaiting um, hearings on um, current alleged offenses. Um, that tool then allows us to use aggravating and mitigating factors so regardless of if, the, if a youth scores in the range of low, moderate, or high risk, we also can mitigate the factors upward or downward. Um, or we can aggravate it upward or downward. So when you see a youth who has been released, I don't want the presumption to be that they're straight released. Many of them are released to an alternative to detention, which could be a community detention mm -hmm. um, uh, agreement. It could be community detention with ER, uh, with um, um, electronic, e electronic monitoring, mm -hmm. monitoring or with ERC, you know, a combination thereof. So because they're released does not mean that they were released without consequence or supervision. Okay. Oftentimes, these the kids that you are seeing return to, to the community who have been arrested and referred to DJS for a, a detention decision, if we release it, it's because they are release eligible and that our tool, which is predictive um, in terms of whether or not they will reoffend, but that doesn't, I mean, it's a tool. Uh, we use a great deal of human intelligence about that as well. Who are the youth? Who are the kids? Um, right. And if they're in the community, are we ensuring that we are providing supervision and having the ability even to elevate levels of supervision for kids who are non-compliant? So we do make every effort to ensure that we are monitoring those kids, um, ensuring um, community safety, and getting them to court, and um, getting them to court without a reoffense. Um, and our um, alternative to detention rate, we have a very high success rate of kids who do appear for court, who do not reoffend, um, but they may actually, and which is different than their recidivism. Mm -hmm. And I think but, I want. I want I think yeah, he has a but for the ones who do, mm -hmm. right? So they they came once and you. Did the evaluation and you determine the risk and they were released mm -hmm. back to the community with whatever parameters you've put in place mm -hmm. but then they've reoffended mm -hmm. at, at what point do you say yeah we can't we can't let you back out with those conditions because that's not working. So each time we evaluate a young person, um, we consider all those factors and also the way the tool is populated, it takes into the account the number of um, alleged offenses that are still pending, uh, which means that you have before you the issue of chronic delinquency. Mm -hmm. uh, which I th believe is uh, more prevalent and more um, problematic in the state um, because we have to have a response for those youth because they still need to be adjudicated on those right, offenses. Right, right. Um, and so we, it's just so dealing with treatment and care is post those procedures of all, you know use of alternatives. Right, and that's a that's a very good point because as noted in the packet and the information that Ms. Farag put in here, there's a significant gap in time mm -hmm. between. You know, the time Process. the first conduct may have occurred and the time of final adjudication when the services are going to be provided. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that's being done in that interim phase to help make sure they're getting their education, that they're actually in school, that they're, they're getting other services, cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever is needed mm -hmm. in that interim period, or is it just perpetually on hold until after final disposition by the court? It depends on the status of a young person. So if we have someone who is currently under active court order for either um, aftercare or probation who commits a new offense, then the, the conditions in terms of the probation order are still in, in place in terms of ensuring that they engage in treatment. If it's a young person who is not under an active court order and they are being presented for a, a new uh, allegation, um, then what we do for that is mainly the safety of ensuring that the kid is attending. So in the court order, if they even are released on an alternative, they still have the requirement for attending school if, um, and, and if there are any services that are currently in place for that young person, they are encouraged to continue that, but we do not do the actual evaluation or treatment or interventions for those kids until we have an actual adjudication of that particular offense and then we move into determining the treatment but that does not mean that we cannot work with community and schools to ensure that young people who are awaiting 
um, mm -hmm. uh, adjudicatory hearing do not begin that they can't receive the services. They can try. We can try to work with them to um, receive services, and we have worked with their parents um, in particular to help them access and identify services. And so, do you receive ongoing notifications from MCPS about their attendance? We do. Some it, for, it depends on um, jurisdictions in Montgomery County. There's a very healthy collaborative between our office and the school system. Um, so, in terms of being able to receive notifications about the youth going to school, if you have a young person who's on a any form of community detention, then we do have monitors, um, CD officers who actually attend school. They go to the school. Mm -hmm. um, they get the school records. If there are kids who are just straight released to the custody of a parent or guardian, um, then we do not necessarily monitor those young people. But one of the gaps that we've begun to understand over the last couple of months is someone who is supporting the kids and the youth in the community, someone who's providing community assistance to parents and youth. So even if you're straight released, least we want to also have an option for someone who is checking in with that youth and their parent and making sure that there are not issues. When you do that evaluation, that initial evaluation, are you checking their attendance records then to note whether or not they are in fact attending school regularly? No, because school attendance is not found to be predictive of a youth's risk of reoffending or failing to appear for court. So our evaluation um, at the point of that decision making is solely upon whether or not a young person meets the criteria for security detention, which is is failure to appear mm -hmm. and be offense. And, and so school attendance it was not seen to be predictive. And is the criteria that you're using for that initial evaluation established in regulation? It is established, and um, some of it is established in regulation in terms of the number of offenses, but our tool was um, developed, I think it's been since 2010 we've been using. Our risk assessment instrument is, has several updates, and it was validated, um, which means deemed to be predictive. Um, and so we have been using that tool for um, quite some time, um, and our results from it have been very good. And for those who have electronic monitoring, mm -hmm. which you noted is one of the methods for, for um, community release, it, are there time restrictions on there at which point they must be at home? Yes. So youth who are under um, any form of alternative to detention supervision, the requirement is that it is with the exception of school attendance, appointments, doctor's appointments, and approved outings with parents or family. They are on 24-7 total house arrests which means that they are not allowed to be outside of the home with the exception of attending school appointments and things of that nature. And they're allowed to work, though. If they, they are allowed job. to work. Yes. That's part of okay. So they are allowed to work, but they are to be home immediately. So we under, so each youth has a schedule, so we know when they are supposed to be in the house. But they, the, the presumption is, tw is total house arrest. And I think Mr. State's attorney was waiting to speak. Uh, <laughs> yeah. just, just a couple of comments. Yeah. First of all, my office only sees when, when it, the potential that a child who comes into the juvenile justice system will ever arrive at the doorstep of the state attorney's office is about three in ten. About seven, seven out of ten will be dealt with. The vast majority uh, are held at intake. We never see them, and quite candidly, there's no mechanism by which we receive information about the individual decisions about each one of them. I, I will say to you. Uh, Resources, 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 programs, programs, programs. I will say to me what the great failure is here, and just, again, I don't know that this necessarily questions what we just heard, but uh, there are 793 spots if someone's committed for placement in this state. Last year there were 1,517 referrals for those 793 spots. Well, what that does is it delays for commitment or for treatment. Uh, I know that when I talk to Carlotta, uh, who heads my unit, uh, it is very often, if we're trying to get, not, not a commitment, I mean, there's a delay for commitment placement. There's a delay for treatment as well. And that typically will, and, and I think this is the frustration when judges come to me, and this is not, this is not public defender, I, I, I think, I'm, I'm assuming that the public defenders have the same frustration too. They want to get their kids into treatment. A three or four month delay Getting a child into treatment is very common. So you separate yourself from when the offense occurred, and then you decide you're going to put the child into treatment, and another three or four months goes by. And, and, and if the child is, if they're actually under the supervision of the court in my situation, this is where the law gets kind of crazy. I think rather arbitrarily we set the limit on probation at six months. 
I well, what if there's a delay of four months getting the child placed, and the limit mm -hmm. of the period of time for which your child can be on probation mm -hmm. in a case is six months? That child gets two months of treatment. Now you can expand it. You can petition to get it expanded, but some of this is some of the problems we're having is that some of the restrictions did not necessarily see what the result was going to be and we're really robbing kids uh, of, of effective treatment. Look, I, I know uh, Councilman Katz, you, you worked with the, uh, the drug courts and things like that. You know, I think that if a kid has a substantial opiate addiction, they need 18 months of treatment from the stuff yeah. that I've read mm -hmm. to beat that, to beat that. And we have prescribed for our children in this state limits of six months of treatment. Well, you might as well throw your money out the window because a person who goes to opiate treatment for 120 days or six, you know that kind of period of time, 96% of the people are going to come back with the same problem. So I, I speak with the same passion, my friend, the chief here, about getting kids programs. What's broken is we don't have sufficient programs, whether it is on the initial referrals, whether it is after they come to my office, or whether the court th throws their hands up and says, I've got to commit this young person. That's all the way at the back end, and that's a very small percentage. There's nowhere for them to go, mm -hmm. or you're going to wait for months for that placement. That is not in anybody's interest. That's why the people that know what are going on are saying, we're t with all due, I th they've got enormous pressures. They're looking for a, a, a more local solution. Right. And I was just going to say, I know that I know that the um, juvenile services education program was moved separate outside of the State Department of Education a couple of years back, and but yet we don't have enough placement to even educate the students within that area with teachers who are um, more specially trained to deal with children who might have substantial disruptions and. If it's only six months max that they could be in those schools or within that education program, um, that in and of itself is considered a disruption in a child's life when you're ping ponging them back and forth between educational environments. And I'm done, but I know you okay, Thank you. I just wanted to clarify a few things. One, um, thank you to the deputy secretary, that, but I don't think she mentioned. Um, that often Ms. Woodward and I are involved earlier in the process. For example, if someone's on probation, they have a new charge, the judge is notified. Often we go in for an emergency hearing and a judge determines should the child be um, released or detained at that point. She mentioned the ERC and I just wanted to highlight that that's the evening reporting center um, which picks the kids up at school, brings them home and provides them services in between. Um, I, I did want to echo something that Mr. McCarthy said earlier, and that is that we currently have no inpatient drug treatment programs for youth who aren't really rich. We do have some, but people can pay out of pocket um, for those programs. We have some in, in the state that are inpatient. They're just not for um, indigent clients that I represent. So um, I think we all agree that we need to provide more services. And I just want to highlight, though, that when a child is in a placement, the restrictions on the probationary period don't apply because they're committed, they're not on probation. So fortunately for my clients who are committed to, for example, a psychiatric hospital, they don't have to leave after a few months if they've waited three months to get there. I know that your constituents are all also facing these issues in the community that when their children are in mental health crisis, um, or need drug treatment, they're, they're begging um, for services. So it would be very helpful to have community-based, um, more of a continuum of care, we all agree, um, for all people, um, whether they can afford it, uh, private care at inpatient services or not. Thank you very much. The committee, we actually have another topic, so we're going to have to move on. I do have Councilmember Mink and Councilmember Finney Gonzalez would like to speak. And then we're going to ask Ms. Farag to wrap up. Councilmember Ming, please. Thank you. Um, so as Ms. McCarthy noted, the, the system is overburdened. Um, I completely echo the sentiments about the additional need, for, the need for more programs, um, the need for options for, for parents and, and others for us to be able to, to help our, our youth, especially um, with serious drug issues. Um, it, 
the, the overburdening is also another good reason to intervene wherever possible before young people get in the system. Um, th there was note of uh, restitution being another intervention that is available, um, uh, with appreciation to Councilmember Luki for noting that one. That one is also available as an MCPS intervention without the involvement of DJS. So it is mentioned in the handbook. Um, it makes specific mention of the state law that was referenced. The principal shall require the student or student's parent or guardian um, or other appropriate individuals to make restitution. Um, so and, and again, the more we can connect youth to interventions, effective interventions, as Chair Katz noted, uh, through our schools or elsewhere instead of through DJS is a good thing because of the overburdening and because as research has established and the federal and state government take as a given, the further kids go in the juvenile justice system, the worse the outcomes are statistically in terms of likelihood of reoffending and recidivism. So again, I think I'm echoing what we've all been saying here that the goal is to get these kids the intervention to happen as soon as possible in the process. Um, and so I want to bring up another means of connecting young people to interventions that is available, um, both pre-arrest and post-arrest, to police, to parents, to the, to the good point about parents who are like, what are my options here? Um, this, is a, this is an option that's open to parents um, and to schools as well as through DJS. Um, in many Maryland jurisdictions, police, schools, DJS, community members, and the state's attorney are using community conference programs. Both, again, both pre-arrest, so that would be the referrals by schools and police or uh, community members, um, and post-arrest where the referrals would be by the state's attorney and DJS. Um, community conference programs are being used by these different agencies and entities in jurisdictions across Maryland um, that include Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Calvert County, Carroll County, Charles County, Harford County, Prince George's County. I was very, very surprised to hear about this and, um, and to see that Montgomery County is not on this list. Um, so community conferencing, for those who don't know, um, is a restorative justice approach. It's a dialogue that's convened by a facilitator uh, in order to give those who've committed an act of harm and the person or persons harmed an opportunity to discuss the matter and potentially find ways to repair the harm or relationship. Um, finding and connecting the offender with appropriate services is also a part of that process. Um, and um, to the point, some, it was a good point that somebody raised, but I don't remember who it was. If the victim doesn't wish to participate, um, in this case with community conferencing, there are alternatives such as a community circle that is convened uh, and so on. Um, if an agreement, and this part is key, if an agreement is not made uh, and fulfilled between the person who committed the harm and either the person who they harmed or whoever has been you know, set up in their place, if that agreement is not made and fulfilled, the referral just goes right back to the referring party. So if MCPD, for example, made that referral to community conferencing and, um, and the kid did not follow through or didn't show up, um, or they made an agreement and they didn't do you know, whatever the community service was that was agreed to, or you know, whatever it is, there's a whole menu of options, of course, that they could come to. Um, MCPD would be informed, and then you could just continue with the referral through the normal process, go to DJS and, and so on. Um, but it's an opportunity, right, to divert some of those cases where possible. Harford County notes that when all those affected by the incident are included in the outcome, compliance with the community conferencing agreements is more than 95 percent. And again, the data on um, improving uh, likelihood of recidivism and, and reoffending is very, very good around these. Uh, it's an alternative to court ca uh, for cases, including second degree assault, automobile theft, breaking and entering, theft or larceny, destruction of property, trespassing, neighborhood conflict, and much more. And so again, when I learned about all this being used in all these other jurisdictions, I was like, I can't believe Montgomery County, we don't have this. This just seems crazy. Um, and then I found out we do have it. We have it here. Montgomery County has a community conferencing program as well, um, who are in touch with all the different programs that are in all these other jurisdictions. Um, it's at the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County. The Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County has partnerships with MCPS, MCPD, DJS, HHS, Recreation, and the state's attorney's office. Um, however, they have not received any requests, any referrals for community conferencing, pre-arrest or post-arrest. 
So this seems like a huge opportunity. Um, I'm not sure like what the miss was, if this, if this has just been like an ongoing communication miss, um, but we're all here thinking about how can we get these kids um, connected with interventions earlier down the line, and this is an opportunity. It's a huge one, and again, if it doesn't, if it's not successful, it just goes right back to the referring party to go through the normal process. So I would would uh, love to hear from anyone on the on the panel um, what you know about the. And maybe this one's a question for the for the public defender in particular. What you know about uh, the effectiveness and use of community conferencing in other jurisdictions, um, but also from our folks at uh, DJS MCPD, um, Mr. McCarthy, about um, you know what you know about community conferencing and why we're. Not not using the Conflict Resolution Center in Montgomery County if this seems like an opportunity to you all as well. And, and I'm going to ask if please keep your, your replies brief. We do need to move on. Please. Please. I think one of the, I, I, I haven't honestly heard about the Conflict Resolution Center, so it's something that we absolutely can look into, and I'd love to contact my counterparts across the state to kind of see how they're doing it. What I can say is, is that statutorily we have timing issues. So if our office receives a particular case, we have to petition it within 30 days. If we do not do that, we are forever barred from ever petitioning that particular case in court. So the issue may come about is, is that how do we effectuate that with our statutory timing issues, as well as with respect to the police, and I won't speak for them, there's a timing issue as well, as how, how long does this process take? And, if it doesn't work, then does that become a speedy trial issue for us to deal with in the future? So I would be happy to reach out to my counterparts to see how they're using it specifically with statutory issues with timing. And so that's where I guess I would just have to figure that out from the state's attorney's great. perspective. Yeah, and I've talked to some of them and would encourage you to do so. They're doing it. And so I think that's, that's a great question and there is an answer. And just briefly for the part of, of DJS, um, just have to tell the truth use of restorative practice and community conferencing and other forms has been underutilized by our agency and it's something that we're addressing now to connect with um, the different resolution centers um, in the different counties. So you should see a boost and an increase of not only our contact with the conflict resolution center but also the use and even supporting some of those mediations. Because we for, do have staff who are trained in restorative I'm, I'm justice. I'm eager to follow up on how, on looking at some of the numbers on how our numbers go up hopefully after okay. this conversation. Thank you. And Thank you. Just briefly, um, I'm happy to to work with Ms. Woodward, I helped uh, set up community conferencing in some of the other jurisdictions around the state and um, went to Council Member Ludke's point. Um, when the victims are amenable in cases, I think it's very much um, helpful to all parties, those who caused the harm and those who were harmed, because everyone's coming together, whereas the court process is often much more adversarial um, and often. Um, I think uh, in, in many ways not as um, productive for the victims and certainly not as effective as Harford County's website shows us. Please. Great, thank you. And as I wrap up, I would just uh, like to make a request that we follow up specifically on community conferencing. I'd love for us all, since it does seem like we are underutilizing and there's just not a ton of knowledge by all of us up here about the details of how we can run through this, it would be great for everybody to kind of go home and, and figure things out, have their conversations, if we could come back here and specifically take a look at that, um, possibly bring in some folks from other areas or whatever might be good, but that would be my, my request to all of us here and to the chair that we come back and take a look at this more deeply. Thank you. Councilmember Member Fanny Gonzalez. Um, I don't live in La La Land. I'm a very practical, I'm a realist. Maybe because uh, when I was in high school 20 years ago, I went to a high school that was packed with MS-13 activities. So, I know, I have seen things that a child should have never seen. So I'm gonna cut to the chase in this whole thing because it's just too much going on here. And I just, um, my districts, for those of who don't know, I'm in Council District 6, which is actually Police District 4. Mm -hmm. um, so in page five of the memo, you can see the graph. It's 209. Um, Joanna arrests or referrals are in my district. Um, so one thing, I, I feel that we do have a pretty bad communication issue here. I mean, I just heard from a couple of you saying that we don't have treatment centers in locally. 
I, since I got to this position, was able to make sure that we found, I have six kids from my district who are in opioid treatment centers right now in my district. And you don't know that? That's just shocking to me. More than that, soon the county is going to be, um, maybe they signed the contract, actually they probably signed the contract last week, uh, and I'm looking at Dr. Stutter. Uh, my issue was that all these juvenile cases that are happening in my district, um, you know, living with little kids, it's, it's not just about talking to the child and having uh, somebody talking to them about, you know, don't use drugs. It's also about having somebody, a case manager who speaks the language to talk to the families and get them involved. So this conversation of juveniles has to include everybody. So that contract that I have fought for since I got here in December is finally going, it's actually, they, they signed it last week, uh, they probably did. That I spoke to uh, Dr. Beegers and he told me that it, it was gonna be signed that evening when I talked to him. So we're gonna have case workers in Wheaton, in Glenmont, in Aspen Hill, um, you know, talking to the kids and the families and placing them in treatment centers here in Montgomery County. And you guys don't know that. Um, what I need from you or whoever is this list of uh, juveniles that have been, I'm just going to use the word, arrested in my district. How can I connect these cases with this contract that we just got so people can, so these are the, the kids at risk. So I need to know how I can get the data to make sure it's happening. Um, that's the only question I have here. Because I know there's privacy concerns, but if we really want to help these kids and our police officers, I mean, I talk to Moco police on a daily basis. They're on my speed dial right now about this issue. This is a crisis, and I don't think people are understanding that. This is not a time to talk about romanticizing the issue and, and, and kumbaya and all that good stuff. This is about taking action and giving help to the kids and to the families to move us forward. Um, it's not about having a circle and talking about our problems. It's more than that. And if you don't understand that, then let me bring you to my district and do a ride along with me. And I'll take you to those hot spots where I see the kids sleeping at 12 midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning on the street because they are, they're passing out with drugs. They're not going to school. And if they do, it's a problem because they're getting all the kids you know, involved in this. So I need the data. Who can get me that data? Is it you, Mr. McCarthy? Who's can I get me so I can coordinate with uh, with this contract? Uh, and don't tell me we can't release it. You need. There has to be a way. It would, it would There's be the, always a way. It would be the Department of Juvenile. It services. would be. It would be Department of Juvenile Who's Services. That here? Who's that? Um, and that's that that's you. Me. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna give him a card and I'm walking out right that's now. Fine. I, and, and I will. I will have our regional director Wanda Frank um, um, touch base with you directly to set a meeting up. But that will be us giving you the data, um, as well as just using this um, opportunity to emphasize that I know you talked about the gang initiative and the three points for us. We're doing six significant reduction in violence and there is uh, prevention intervention but that third piece is community transformation okay. which means pushing back to local investment Beautiful. in local resources and not no longer doing these large centralized state contracts that do not serve the local communities in a way to get you the results that you I want. I love it. But so, just, we'll just giving you a warning. Do not mm -hmm. give me excuses mm -hmm. when I'm asking for a data. Okay. I just, I don't want to waste my time. If it's something that I can provide, um, which are which is primarily trend data and not individual youth data, right. but trend data, but ensuring that you get those kids to the services, I hear yes. your passion and we will facilitate that for you. All right. That's it. That's all I wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your passion, for sure. Ms. Frog, is there anything else on the packet? Just, there's nothing on the packet, but just briefly, I will follow up with all the stakeholders to get the information that you're asking for, including the data and looking at the community conferencing. These are items as far as um, linking children with services in a more efficient and effective way that m you might consider bringing back to a triple or a joint or a triple committee, probably HHS, Public Safety, and ENC. So. I think that makes sense. Um, and we're going to finish this. But, you know, first off, let me, I know this is going to come as a shock. I was actually in high school longer than 20 years ago. Uh -huh. Ms. McCarthy, don't start with me because so are you. But anyhow, um, but bottom line is years ago, 
the the there was a program that the I was mayor of Gaithersburg and there was a program that you could visit. It was like right along with a judge for a day. I'm I'm going back a long time, and I believe Judge Johnson was in in, in juvenile court in that day, and I was in the back of the courtroom and there was a young man who had issues. I mean the courtroom was closed. A young man that had issues and. His his uh, he was going to needed to go to a program uh, outside the home. I don't know what the proper term would be, but anyhow, they couldn't find a place for him. And Judge Johnson, I believe it was Judge Johnson, said, um, "We'll send this young man home, and in five six weeks, when they can find a, a bed, that they would you know bring him for that purpose." And the mother stood up in that courtroom and said, "I don't want that. I don't want the child home." And, and of course, uh, I mean, you all deal with this on a daily basis. I, it absolutely shocked me. I mean, I, I never met a mother that didn't want their child. And so it's always stuck in my mind. We need to think about what we're doing way beyond our own, our own thought process because it's, it's just a very difficult thing. I thank you all for doing what you're doing. I thank everyone that had spoke with, with uh, the, the concerns that they have. This is a community problem, and the community needs to solve it, and we need to all work together to do that. And with that, I'm going to say this, this part of the committee meeting is, is finished, and we're going to turn now to the second part uh, for the uh, work session on the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services and the proposed master plan. If I could please invite everyone down from, for that panel. And I, and I want to thank them early on for, though I know that they found every word we said interesting, I want to thank them early on for sitting through the first panel. We probably should have done it in reverse because I don't know that your panel will be here as long. If I could ask the... the if I could ask anyone that is going to get information, et cetera, if they could do that in the hallway. Are we playing musical chairs? Yeah. On? <laughs> Once again, we thank you all for being here. I'm going to ask the panel if they would please introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Bailey. Charles Bailey, Division Chief Operations Fire Rescue. John Kinsley, the Interim Fire Chief. Melissa Schultz, Planning Manager for Montgomery County Fire Rescue. Logan Ambinder, Legislative Analyst with Central Staff. And we know who we still know who you are, Ms. Farag. We appreciate that. Um, does anybody on the panel on the committee have anything to say as we begin? Ms. Frog, if you would please lead us through the, the master plan, which you've been working on for a long time here. Sure, thank you. Um, statutorily... Um, I'm sorry, did you have an opening statement? Oh. If, if you did, please. I'm sorry. Well, I can make one up real quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no need to. We Go ahead. Yeah. No, just uh, to save time, um, I'll turn things over to Chief Bailey and Dr. Schultz with my thanks and appreciation for working many, many months on this uh, project. And I think that you'll find that this master plan is a little different from the old fire defense master plans that we used to do. This plan actually sets the organization up to be able to adapt to a changing environment, um, lessons we learned during the COVID pandemic. Um, so I think it you'll see that it really sets us up to be able to adapt as things change and be able to respond and react to those changes more rapidly. So I'll turn it over to Susan. She can run through the slides um, with Dr. Schultz uh, talking about it. And, and there again, jump in. Just let me, you know, wave to me or throw something at me or throw something at Charles. That would be okay too. But, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, please. So the county code does require the fire chief to develop a master fire rescue and emergency service master plan for approval by both the county executive and the county council. And there's one in place now. It was supposed to expire in FY22. Um, it has undergone two extension requests, which have both been approved by council. And the current plan will be effective through December 31st, 2023. Um, 
the fire department had asked for extensions for a variety of reasons. They had some staff changes, but they also uh, wanted to get updated numbers and information from the 2020 census. And they also wanted to be able to align the master plan's goals with um, Thrive Montgomery, which was under consideration um, at the time this, the current plan was supposed to expire, and to seek additional community feedback. So today, the committee's going to receive a preview of their draft master plan for comment and questions. This briefing will provide the committee with a preview of the plan, which if approved would cover 2024 through 2030. Depending on any feedback that you have um, to the fire department, they can finalize a master plan and formally submit it to the council for approval. At that time, the council may schedule a public hearing to receive any additional community feedback. Um, if necessary, there may be additional community work sessions committee work sessions scheduled as well, and then the council can take action. This is starting to push up against recess in December. Mm -hmm. um, so right. depending on the timing, we might need to do another uh, resolution that extends the current master plan into January or so. Which which would not be what we would like to do. If we need yeah. to do it, we need to do it. Right. But we've been dragging uh, our feet on this, and, and not yours, yours fault necessarily, but... but uh, We've got to get this done. So and, um, you go ahead. I'm sorry. And um, Chief Kinsley will speak more to this. And we do have a um, PowerPoint that we'll go through or the yeah. department will go through. But this draft master plan is taking a very proactive approach. It's to help build out community resilience, to help prevent events rather than just rely on reactive, responsive fire and EMS. And it also works to develop the departmental resilience as well. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to the department and try to keep up when they need new slides. So. Thank you, Susan. You did a great job. You can go to the next slide. Susan really did a great job summing up the legislative requirements. So right now I'll jump into the process that we had. Please. The existing plan, as you heard, was supposed to expire June of 2022. In 2020, when the update process should have started, COVID happened. I think that was, that was okay for us. I was actually still new to the fire department, having come from the police side. Uh, and there was a lot going on that year. So when we finally uh, began the update process in 2021, I recommended a smaller work group to uh, dig into what we were looking at with COVID still going on and just what uh, the accomplishments that we had made from the previous plan and what we were looking at going forward. So we started with a very small work group that included a couple of battalion chiefs, a couple of assistant chiefs, Division Chief Bailey was part of that. IAFF and the Volunteer Fire Rescue Association had also named representatives to sit on that work group with us, uh, representing their organizations. And then we had a couple of civilian managers as well. Uh, from there, uh, you heard Susan mentioned later in 2021, we were wrapped up in uh, two more studies that were, we were tasked with under the County Executive's Reimagining Public Safety Initiative, one related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the other one on staffing and deployment. We needed a little bit of time to let those processes play out, and we were still waiting for uh, the 2020 census data to be released. We thought that that was very important. But there was enough changes that had occurred between 2010 and 2020 to give a little bit more time to be able to digest that and see what the county was looking like at that point. Uh, in May 2023, we went ahead and we had a big, we took the, the small work group and we expanded it out. We had a multidisciplinary work session that invited the Office of Emergency Management, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, DPS, OMB, the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, and the Regional Service Center directors were also invited. And we really took some time to discuss the current and future state of the county and how uh, Fire Rescue was going to approach this master plan. We felt pretty confident coming out of that meeting. Uh, in July, we created and published a website introducing the approach that we were taking and the themes, asking for public input. This was the first time Fire Rescue had ever done anything like this so far ahead in the process, asking for, for feedback. And we were presenting our ideas because they were so drastically different than what had been published in previous plans. We left that open for review. We 
drafted a plan and shared it to the unions and the Fire and Emergency Services Commission for for review and input in the beginning of September. It was released for public review at the beginning of October, and then October 12th, we had a public meeting at Station 25. And just this past Friday, we had some additional discussion with a couple of members of the commission, and I believe we are on their agenda to continue some discussion at their next regularly scheduled meeting. Next slide, please, Susan. You received our draft last week. This really does, as you heard Susan mention, and the chief mentioned, this is a different way of thinking about the delivery of fire and rescue services. We are redefining our thought processes and our operational approaches, which will allow us to remain relevant as things around us continue to change. Our thought, process, our thought processes have been informed by literature and theory, so this plan reads differently than previous plans that we've published. This plan does not define an end state. That is, that is a pretty important point I would like you to hold on to. You will see our goals that are defined in Chapter 21 here in the plan, and you will see our strategies, which are our general approaches to problem solving. And then we've also outlined toward the end of the plan our six-year action list of action items. And those are uh, basically to guide us, based on the little bit of information we have now, uh, what we should be working on for the next six years. What you don't see here is what internal going to have to develop some uh, a work plan for each fiscal year as we go through the budget process. It's important we'll have to reevaluate where we are and what's happening around us uh, because to just set uh, some target goals and not reevaluate where we are is silly. Uh, next slide, please. I think if you uh, have looked at the plan at all, you will notice uh, there's been a shift in the language. For example, as you can see here, our mission and vision statements were, were updated. You see that the language here uh, is a lot more concise than what we've had in the past, but what you'll notice, hopefully notice, is that there is a very important and subtle shift away from our, our pure, purely operational and reactive focus to a focus on our vulnerable populations and prevention measures. And I think in addition to the, the reduction in the number of words, which makes a much easier concept to internalize, what, what you're seeing now are the core ideas on which the balance of our work is based. So we're simply redefining or shifting our language structure that we used to talk about what is important to us. And this, we think, will open the door for some new ways of thinking. Next slide, please, Susan. Let's talk about that real fast. Vulnerability. One of the first things that came out of the work group session, the master plan work group session in 2021, was a, a redefining of how we approach risk. And the result of that effort, which is that document that is pictured on the slides, really uh, represents an expansion of our knowledge and understanding of this subject. What we found as we explored the notion of risk is that it is tightly correlated with the notion of social vulnerability, and that's the extent to which an individual or a group is subject to harm. We see this, Fire Rescue sees this, as a proxy for equity. And this is the first master plan in which we tried to incorporate the concept of equity and express the need to build better capacity to understand that. Moreover, our, shift, our view has shifted from that of a local level to a more broad countywide network approach. Historically, the fire department has always looked at stuff, data, uh, deployment staffing at a station response area level, box area level, all the way down to the, that micro box level. But our recent work has shown that we actually lose a lot of sensitivity to our de data that way. So we're shifting and implementing solutions that will allow us to analyze at the census track level. And this uh, is a positive. It aligns with existing tools that we've already started using internally, uh, such as the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index. Resilience, we believe, uh, resilience or the ability to absorb, adjust, and recover from shock is an antidote to social vulnerability. 
The master plan discusses this from both a community perspective and an organizational perspective. From the community perspective, resilience is a function, we believe, of education and preparedness, response and recovery. That is what Fire Rescue needs to focus on. As an organization, internally, we are extremely dependent on fixed resources, uh, our stations, our apparatus, and they're pretty expensive. And we must look for ways to move that value across the network as we learn and build context of the world around us. Which brings us to this whole concept of value and what we mean by that. When we talk about the notion of delivering value, we're looking at value as a, as a relationship between quality and cost. MCFRS doesn't get to define value, that's the community does via their elected officials. And we really only have limited control over our costs, which makes things pretty tough for us. Next slide, please, Susan. <clears throat> Our goals, I've thrown these up here again. Um, if you're not familiar with Chapter 21, they are defined there, Chapter 21. Those are defined for us. What we want you to get from this, please notice the language, the use of the words maximize and optimize. Even though these were written several years ago, we don't think that it's a mistake that those that language there is um, vague it doesn't uh there's no ex their expressions of uncertainty it doesn't say that we should have x amount of fire engines or y amount of ambulances uh, there uh, we also get from it the the notion that uh that there's a boundary condition uh, the boundary condition that we cannot uh prevent the loss of all life or present, prevent the loss of all property. Those are things that we have to pay attention to as we're moving forward. What you see here is the language of uh, containment and the language of problem management versus problem solving. Next slide, please. This slide here, we want you to know we are paying attention we're paying attention to our numbers. This is just by large categories across the life of the existing plan till our current current year, ending September 30th. We are monitoring our workload. We're asking questions. We're building context. Uh, this slide doesn't give you enough information. We have made operational changes over the last several years to address this increasing call volume, but the department cannot address every increase and call volume with a re responsive increase in assets. We just, it's not possible. Uh, there's an upper limit to our response capabilities, an upper limit to our response assets. There's an upper limit to our budget. And unfortunately, what this really boring slide doesn't show is that the complexity of our calls are changing and there's a lot more uncertainty and ambiguity surrounding those. Really quickly, and we can just go through the next two really fast. It doesn't matter which one you pull up, whether it's this, the comparison of FY14 versus FY23 full assignments or the next one that just shows ALS, it doesn't matter which one you have up. What we want you to see here is what we call fondly our response shape. Uh, this response shape, as you can see, hasn't changed over the course of the, uh, the whole plan and what we're looking at right now. This is where our most vulnerable people live. This is what we've already started digging into to try to understand better. This is also where we have 74% right now of our response assets are within this response shape where all of these incidents are happening. Next slide. Again, you see it, same response shape. Keep going, please. Which brings us to our strategies and this is probably one of the most important parts of the plan. Uh, when we're talking about uh, can notice, can relate, can adapt. This is how we need to approach everything. Um, it's a focus on, can notice is our focus on describing the present and understanding the future. We have to make, we have to make meaning out of the change that is happening around us. Can relate is a focus on managing the interactions between us and others based on the idea that success is found in the product of those interactions. There are a number of partners here in the county that we've already got 
uh, some really good relationships with, but we have found that if we leverage what we each bring to the table, that we can do a lot more beyond that. And then can adapt. Two things here, the willingness and the ability to change in response to change in circumstances. We can't say that everything around us is complex and ambiguous and still rely on our outdated methodologies of solving problems and doing things and ex expect to be successful. Next slide, please. Our focus areas. I'm just going to leave this up here, the well-being of people, ensuring value. You see our building capacity to understand racial equity and build community resilience. These are our focus areas and we will build out work items every year based on these specific areas. I don't think there's anything that would surprise you up here. Uh, I will wrap it up by repeating that the document itself that you're looking at today is in, intended to introduce these new methodologies to improve or increase our understanding. So much of our first year's efforts will be focused on learning and retooling existing stuff. Going through this process has already challenged current modes of discourse about how we operate. We've got people paying attention. People are talking uh, about this plan. We've talked about it with everybody uh, throughout the county at different levels. And we're excited to wrap this up now and throw some weight behind the work that actually has to be done. So let's hope we don't need another extension. Thank you very much. Ms. Frog, did you have any? Um, no, I think Dr. Schultz had covered everything, including my potential discussion questions. Um, one of the things I've been working with the department is to try to really understand better how community vulnerability correlates to racial equity initiatives, um, which can be confusing. It's easier on the preventive side. Um, it gets a little harder on the response side. So, um, Anybody else on the panel? If not, we'll... First off, go ahead. Did you? No. no. no? The... the um, First off, I want to thank you for your hard work. And I know, you know, we got a four, whatever it is, a, a 11 page uh, uh, PowerPoint. And, and uh, so much work went into each page, in each line of each page. And, and we certainly ap appreciate that. I, I uh, know that all of us are thankful that you've involved the community and continue to involve the community the, the way that you have and the way that we should be doing. Um, but this document is one that is not only needed for Montgomery and County Fire and Rescue Service, but for the entire community. I mean, these this is saving people's lives, and we have to make certain that we continue, because we do it, but that we continue to do it. And you mentioned the words maximize and auto, uh, optimize. It never goes out of style, and it should um, we there's times that you can change doing it the way you, we do it, but there there has to be a uh, a, real, a, re, a realization of what we're doing and how we how we perform it. On page seven of your of your uh, uh, document today, um, it, it reminds us once again that EMS calls are by far the most calls the most. Uh, you know, we, we call it fire and rescue services, and it is, but it's the rescue part where most people, thank goodness. I mean, we don't want fires. We don't want people to have a heart attack either, but we, we have a whole lot more res need of response and for EMS than we do for the fires part. In your, your one slide, I don't remember what number it was, on, but it, it shows once again that our most dense areas are the areas that are receiving the most calls. It makes sense, yeah. Uh, that it, it's the areas that we're receiving the most calls. But, and, and, and we need to make certain that the, the resources are there to, to save the lives in, in those dense areas. But we can't lose sight of maybe uh, Hyattstown doesn't have uh, the, the numbers of calls, but a life in Hyattstown needs to be saved just as much as every other life in, in, in Montgomery County. So we we have to make certain that we're, our response times are, are what they need to be and and all of those those necessary uh, areas. 
and and that you have the resources that are necessary, that you have the budgets that are necessary, you have the personnel that is necessary. And I think that this document from is goes a long way to help us make certain that that's where we are. So from the committee. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and thank you for doing this big vision that I know you need to review on a regular basis, as you said, because things need to be adjusted as you go along and you live and you work with it. Um, in terms of re-engagement with the goals and re-engagement with what you're doing, how often do you think or anticipate that you will be revisiting that to see, you know, we've got a multi-year plan, but I, I hear we are and we have to make an adjustment. So what do you expect that to be? Good morning. And I guess what you're asking is how often do we plan to come back and think through the problems and the, our solutions to the problems, am I correct? Yes, right. <clears throat> every day. And obviously it won't be every single hour of every single day, but what this sets up is this continuous pattern of learning and engagement with the facts and the, the contextual reality of the, of the workspace. This is a six-year plan with the intent of building smaller plans underneath it and coming back and asking ourselves every year or every few months even, is the context aligned with what we thought it was going to be or our methods still appropriate? Where do we need to adjust? So, right, right. Now, un understanding that you all learn from the work every day, that's obviously an integral part of what you do. but. Uh, my question was more specific. Quarterly, are you planning quarterly, twice a year? What are you planning to do in terms of a more formalistic engagement with the plan and revisions? That is a great question. As it stands today, it has to be at least once a year. But we're also an accredited agency, and one of the things we just came out of an accreditation process and what we're attempting to do there outside the scope of this plan is to take accreditation and make it less of a project or more of a process, mm -hmm. which would call for much more frequent reevaluation of where we are in space. Mm -hmm. So whether it's quarterly or weekly depends, it's scale dependent, but you can expect that the frequency of review will certainly go up. And then um, I know Councilmember Katz directed your attention back to the slide with the, the dispatch incidents numbers where we have the, the ones thus far year to date for, for 2023. And um, you know, understanding, of course, that in 2020 numbers took a dip for a host of reasons uh, in that first year of the pandemic. But also knowing that what I call busy season, which is right around Thanksgiving all the way through the, the New Year holiday. Um, and, and in the 2021 calendar year data and 2022 calendar year data, where again, we had a big jump in numbers year over year, was that phase of the year significant in uptick in calls for service? So I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll take that too. One of the most interesting things about this chart, and we, we used it a couple of days ago in another meeting with some of our contemporaries, is that one wants to look at these numbers and extract meaning from it, and I don't believe that the data is configured in such a way that allows you to make any reasonable determinations over what you see here. Where you see, what you see is a growth. Is that growth significant? Is that growth spread out through the entire county, or are we only seeing that growth in the response shape? But the more important question, and the question we want to be focused on is why? What is it that is driving this? And it's the truth of the matter is going to be multimodal, multi scale, and all these different social aspects of the universe interacting to create these increases. This plan really begs for the time. It's begging you, the public, for you, for the time to sit back and really get into uh, what we're doing and why. And, and ask the question, are we even looking at the right data sets? So I don't know how much time of year impacts this. That's a whole different set of calculations. I'll tell you, interestingly, what we noticed recently by accident, there is a period of day like 9 to 9, 10 to 10, where the system peaks and it peaks consistently. Mm -hmm. Demand peaks, right? Mm -hmm. 
but that's not true throughout the entire system. So we started to look at one work site for a different reason. We found out that for that work site, the peak has shifted, um, and it really picks up at like eight or six o'clock at night, runs to three o'clock in the morning, and that during that time period, that one station's total response, or as compared to the, what they respond to, as compared to the county as a whole, their share was like disproportionately high. It begs questions. Why? Right? And that takes time and it takes energy and it may take some Amazon web servers, you know, to run models and calculations to get to the why. And we argue that one should not be making too many adjustments to resources until we can answer those sorts of questions. So this is about building capacity to understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, you know, totally with the other slides that you had regarding the, the in most intense areas of call volume, which are densely populated areas, equity focused areas, areas, frankly, where people don't have as great of access to preventive medical care. Right. And th those are other things we know, not from this hearing, but from other other work we do. So that that's a known factor. But um, I guess my question or the, the comment asking about the numbers since we only have partial year to date for 2023 is that it is customary that there is an uptick during that fourth quarter of every calendar year in service calls. It's pretty routine. And that you would not anticipate that the year to date call numbers at the end of this year would be significantly lower than 2022. In fact, it may even be higher. There's always a risk for prognostication, but I think that your line of thinking is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Mitt. Thank you. Um, I really want to commend you all for the, um, you know, for having some agility and creativity in your approach here. I think that's not always something that people think of when they think about plans like these that are put together by county governments and you all uh, decided to take a, a fresh look um, at a very difficult time when we're all very strapped for resources and, and needs are accelerating. So I want to really commend you uh, for taking it upon yourselves to do that. Um, a couple questions. Uh, okay, at the bottom of page 19 on racial equity, um, as you noted, um, Fire Rescue is firmly committed to adopting, advancing, and perfecting the racial equity framework expressed by the ORESJ. And over the last couple of years, um, Fire Rescue has begun work in this space. However, our understanding of the meaning and operationalization of advancing racial equity is in its nascent stages, and development of that capacity is a priority. Um, and you specifically noted that um, you know it's been a struggle to find research literature that is specific to municipal fire services. Uh, and so um, you did, however, find an extensive body of work um, on, as you mentioned, the nexus between social vulnerability and equity um, based on large scale disasters. And so um, worked to use that as a proxy in this case uh, to help guide some of the, some of the work and initiatives here. Um, and I wondered if you had been able to use the county's data on equity focus areas. Um, if that was something that you had had looked at to understand potential racial equity and social justice disparities in, in response times or resident outcomes, or if that was an angle that you all had looked at already. Yes. So we looked, we started out with EEAs, equity, equity emphasis areas, which were the COG areas. We sat with park and planning on Reedy Drive and talked through some of that, and then we switched to using EFAs which are equity focus areas. Right. And now park and planning has a new concept that I didn't write down because I did not anticipate this question. And we're kind of looking at that new concept they have. I forget the name of it. To wrap it all up, yes, we're looking at social vulnerability, but instead of the way we historically did it, which is based on the fire station response area, we're now looking or getting better at looking at census tract data because we can't draw conclusions about the nature of people's proximity to uh, poverty, intimacy with poverty, or this, this big deal of limited English proficiency at the response area. We can do it at the census tract level. So we're actually making some shifts um, in our data sets to do that. 
I just said all that and want to make sure that I answered your question. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and I appreciate that you all are digging into this. And so my question is really, and I know that you have done your done your best here to, to move this to move this forward, and that you're continuing to do so. Nobody made you add that section right into the report. Um, so yeah, I appreciate hearing that, and I think we'll be interested to keep uh, you know hearing from you what else you learn and how you figure out new ways to use this data to you know make our, our plans more equitable moving forward, and to uh, you know assure the public that that's uh, something that we are truly advancing, so thank you for that information. And my other question um, is about uh, new stations that were in the in the previous master plan. Obviously, there's fiscal constraints, of course, among other issues. Um, there are two of those stations of, of the, I think, four that were removed that would impact my district, District 5, tremendously. One of them is a, was a potential East County station, um, and the other one was a Norback one that would serve the leisure world community. And in the previous master plan, um, there is a very good case made for how important those stations are. And so I wondered if you could speak to how the current plan, how you've thought about addressing some of those needs given that those stations are not uh, you know, in the works. Yes. The previous plan made a serious assumptions about how the world worked, and to a certain extent, you, if you go back through the logic, there's a tight association between increases in population and increased call volume. We are struggling to find that relationship, whether it's with our own data sets or data sets that we seek out all across the world. We can make two associations that seem really intuitive and that there's some validation for. One is that an increase in the number of people aging, um, right, will lead to an increased demand. And two, one's intimacy with those 16 social vulnerability factors will necessarily cause a rate increase. What we don't know for sure is which ones, but more importantly, what we don't know yet is which ones are having the most decisive impact locally. So there's national level data that says people of a certain uh, race are dispar or disproportionately impacted by you know health problem X. Is that true in Montgomery County? So one of the things we've done is created uh, or deepened our relationship with HHS. We now have a member on the Healthy Montgomery Steering Committee. Uh, we're starting to look at all those health care and equities that are out there and looking for places where the fire department can actually have an impact. Now I want to drive back to your question, why not a fire station in White Oak? What proof is there that a fire station in White Oak is going to be the question to, or the answer to the question of what ails White Oak? Can we find ways to evaluate what's going on there? That Route 29 quarter is full of EFAs. It is lit up very high on the density map. What's driving that? And can we deploy alternate solutions to that neighborhood that drive the need down? One of the examples I use, to, I love to use, and I always get the terminology wrong, so you'll just bear with me, I hope. We all agree that if someone's having a stroke, it's important to get them to the hospital in a certain amount of time for a medical intervention. Well, there's this time interval between when the stroke symptom first pops up and when they call 911, and we don't control that. But that's a pretty big deal. That interval, I won't guess the number, but it's been high like 12, 15, 16 hours. If you're sitting at home with stroke symptoms for 16 hours before calling 911, my response times don't matter as much. The eight minutes or 10 minutes it takes me to get there in the presence of that interval, they don't matter as much. Likewise, if you call me three minutes into it, three minutes after the first symptom, the fact that it took me 10 minutes to get there doesn't matter much, right? we are still able to get there, intervene, deliver you to the, to the emergency room or the stroke center, because it's not just any emergency room, and have a huge demonstrative impact on improved outcomes in the community. And that may be as simple as a lesson we learned recently. 
we went into a neighborhood after a fire and we handed out our flyers and we handed them out in English and we handed them out in Spanish because we are progressive and we're paying attention and we know that English isn't always the primary language. Then we went back to that neighborhood as we promised you we would and we found out that it didn't matter we did it in English and Spanish because they speak French and Farsi and and yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Right? So we felt like we were doing a really good job. The firefighters were out there. No one complained. We, when we did the master plan website, we did it in five languages, the five top languages. We didn't get the six, seven, eight, nine. So we start looking and we go back to this neighborhood. Now we work with community partnerships because we learned something. Now we go back, and this time we go back with different information that's culturally appropriate, and it's not just a Google Translate, it is a idiomatic translation, it's a culturally appropriate translation, and we go back and now we're attempting to affect change um, in those ways. And then we're trying to think of ways that, you know, beyond the standard pass out the fire helmet and talk about stop, drop, and roll, how is it that we get into community at risk and make demonstrable change to the, not to the living conditions, we don't control that, but to the way that they understand the risks that they face, right, and how they are prepared to interact appropriately when those risks uh, manifest themselves. Are fire engines important? Absolutely. Are they the only important thing? And we're saying maybe not, and maybe we should spend some time before we spend your money and making sure that where we're deploying resources and, and assets, that we're doing it in the right way for the right reasons. So we beg your indulgence on the review and the data. That is such a good answer. <laughs> and I think it is so important. Um, it, you know, I, I want to really publicly thank you for the work that you all have done, that you specifically have done also with our residents at the Enclave in White Oak. It has meant a lot to the, com com to the community. It means a lot to me. And to your point about how, um, how important it is to look at what we can do on the prevention side and on the efficiency side, as opposed to saying, here's the anticipated need. Let's build up and build up and build up and build up. How can we cut down on what that need looks like? That's how we should be approaching uh, you know, these types of capacity questions in, in every single department. You know, how can we ha have less complaints to the Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs? How can we have fewer calls to the, to the police? We just we were talking about juvenile justice, and we were all talking about how can we be sending fewer kids through the juvenile justice system. Um, you know, we should, before we're thinking about build, 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 build capacity, um, we need to be putting, uh, there's huge payoff for building in the pre-work beforehand to, to avoid that. And so, you know, one of the recommendations that you made to the Afghan community when you came through was to make sure, for example, that if they are calling uh, 911, that they are referencing their building by address. As one example, one of several of your kind of top recommendations, as opposed to just by the building number, just to help with that efficiency piece. And that they all know that now. The word has has really, really spread. And so sometimes, you know, just hearing uh, uh, that messaging and working with the community-based groups to get the word out can make such a tremendous, tremendous difference. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, and I think also then important for us to make sure that we are plugged into getting information not just about the capacity questions and how you're responding, but that we're continuing to get clear information from you all about the work that you are doing and the work that you're doing with community groups and so on to reduce the numbers on the prevention side, because that's a really important part of the equation too, and we want to be invested in that as well and make sure that the public knows that that, that is part of the job here also. Um, one last quick question on fire sprinklers, which has been a hot topic, obviously, uh, for very unfortunate reasons, um, with a reference on page 32. Um, and, uh, you know, as we think about the changing, urbanizing, built environment, we know very well the tragedies around the failure to install suppression systems. Um, do we have any success stories that we can point to about these new fire suppression systems as preventative measures, saving lives, curtailing damage uh, to people and property. Um, can, we, can you speak to that or anything else that you might want to say about the fire, fire sprinklers? 
I say you have a knack for bringing up the questions that I just didn't take notes for, so next time I won't make I do any notes. Yeah. Next time I'll talk to you before. <laughs> Sprinkler systems are amazing. And what they're designed to do, especially in a residential environment, is to increase the likelihood that the persons who are intimate with the fire, people in that compartment, are able to escape alive. They are not 100%. Sometimes the system fails, the sprinkler system. There's a stuck valve or a fault somewhere in the system. I'll tell you a story of a recent incident in Silver Spring where a maintenance worker, there was a break in the sprinkler system in one week and it flooded the building and it was pretty significant. They get it fixed. A couple of weeks later, there's a fire and the maintenance worker doesn't understand the, didn't understand the problem with the fire, but he did understand the problem with the water damage and he isolated and shut down the sprinkler system before it can completely control the fire. We can't control that. DPS can't control that. Those are people interacting with systems. Unfortunately, we have had an occasion this year where someone who was elderly and mobility impaired lived in a building that was fully sprinklered and still unfortunately died. There is no silver bullet that we have been able to isolate or identify. What we believe in, both in terms of our internal operations, is a layered approach, a pattern of defenses. We also believe that that is the most prudent method um, in, the, in the built environment. The built environment, the, and this is important, there are 80 something, somewhere around 80 unsprinkled residential high rises in Montgomery County, right? And that's, that's, that's problematic in, in whatever way that is problematic. But it's not our only problem. Those tend to be older buildings. Now we're building buildings that are high rises sideways, right? And in some cases, just a few inches short of meeting code requirements for increased protection. In some cases, we're getting to the buildings faster, right? Within these response times that we talk about, and we get a complaint, it took so long, and it turns out that what took so long wasn't getting there. What took so long was navigating these structures because they're essentially high rises on their side. Mm -hmm. The complexity in the built environment is growing at a rate that is hard to manage. I promise you that if you looked at a fire, modern fire alarm panel, you would need at least the first three years of a mechanical engineering degree to sort through what it was saying. And But my, my, my teams out there have to deal with these new ones, and they have to deal with the ones that are legacy systems, like mm -hmm. 12001 Old Columbia Pike, where mm -hmm. they had a small fire yesterday. There was a small fire, 12,001 Old Columbia Pike, and I know the fire that we're referencing in Silver Spring, and the difference there was not the sprinkler system. The difference was the door from the apartment to the common door corridor was closed. Mm. There are three things that matter. Early suppression, that can come in the form of a sprinkler head, or we can put a box of armor firefighters in the basement of every building prepared to jump up. Early notification, George Avenue, we had a delayed notification. And compartmentation, closing the door from the apartment to the hallway is probably the most important thing you can do to the fact that now we teach our firefighters, that yes, the hose is important, but one person or one team together that goes to that apartment door and closes it likely saves as many, if not more, lives. Again, when we start talking about response times and all a lot of stuff, it is based on outmoded ways of approaching the universe. Your response times is outlined in NFPA for fire engines were based on our ability to arrive and prevent flashover. And when they were created, there was this notion that we could do that if we got there within five minutes or eight minutes or whatever it is. In the modern environment with the materials that are in your house, from the time the fire starts, you have three minutes to get out with your life, three minutes. And no one 
that has the money to build enough fire stations to get me there mm -hmm. and engage within three minutes to 100% of the county. What do we have to do? We have got to increase the number of people who are in the prevention world, and we have got to make it so that you're having fewer fires, and then when you do have a fire, you're doing the right thing. And sometimes, most of the time, the right thing is simple as close the door. That closed door yesterday prevented displacements, it prevented loss of lives, and it prevented property damage, and it didn't cost us anything. Where are we going to be back in that neighborhood today? Absolutely. We're always coming back. And what are we going to reinforce? We're going to reinforce how important it is to just pull the door tight. The other neat thing that we're doing is that our relationship with DPS and DHCA, the enclave drove innovation in county government. We are talking more than we ever have been before. And my fire guys and people, there's 318 of them out there every day. I, I may have the numbers wrong. I don't do the staffing. They are human ground sensors, and it is as simple as they go in an apartment complex and they notice that the self-closing door mechanism doesn't work, and they report that to DPS. DPS goes in and finds out, or DHCA, depending on the situation, that new carpet was installed, mm -hmm. and they got the height wrong, and it's impacting the self-closing door. And the inspector goes by, writes a notice of violation, the apartment complex fixes that problem with the doors. We've done more to save human lives with that one act that we could do with any $3 million worth of fire trucks. Mm -hmm. We want to be in the community and change lives and make people better improve their well-being. We don't believe that we need to deploy all the old methods and all the old thinking to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I will note that when we were talking about the Arrive fire back a few months ago and close before you doze was one of the things that we talked about and I had never heard about that before and Councilmember Balcom mentioned too that that was also new to her and that ever since then she had been closing her doors at night and I've done the same thing not just the bedroom doors for myself and my kids but I close all the doors I'm like compartmentalize everything there's a fire in the dryer boom seal off but whatever I'm closing all the doors everywhere and um, it's it's such a simple thing costs us nothing like you said and, and um, we uh, you know I'd be interested in maybe talking to our comms team about how we can think about just helping to helping you all to get that message out there because it's it's so so critical and uh, really appreciate the focus on prevention here uh, that is uh, it, that's how we keep people safe on the front end and also conserve resources at the same time so thanks very much thank you and, and I think um, um, Charles you, you touched on a couple things that I think we should do some follow-up on number one the building codes uh, we need to coordinate if you said there's a couple inches shorter and and you know that they would have had other there shouldn't be a loophole for for safety and so I think we need to figure out and I know there's Boca codes and they're nationally approved and you know yada yada but I think we need to do some follow-up on that I think to close the door should be on every newsletter from all of us and for every homeowners association and every every uh, group that to remind us and it shouldn't get to the point that we see it so much that people don't pay attention to it we need to we need to make certain that people are aware of, of how very important to uh, Councilmember Ming's point this this is and then the only other thing I have is that we have the year to date um, uh, incidents but it would have been it, it, it would be helpful to me if we had for instance for 2022 what the year to date would have been versus the year to date for you know for the uh, if this is till October if the year to date is till October what the year to date was on 2022 till October so that we can compare to your point uh, you know I know that the busy season is upon us but but that would be helpful too uh, if we could do that and anything else from Logan or Susan again thank you so very much yes sir am I am I correct in hearing that we should give some follow-up on this chart it, it doesn't have some to more be, detail it doesn't have to be the most in-depth but it would just be helpful if we're talking a year to date that we could tell how much the trend really 
I mean, or, I, I'm assuming we are up, but we can't tell that from this chart. Fair enough. I, I think there's, I, and since this de debuted, we've reconstructed the data in a different way. It shouldn't take but a few minutes to get something back through Susan. Well, and, and that becomes part of the problem when whenever we're dealing with it. Sometimes you say, well, you know, th this information we're getting, not in this case, but this information we're getting is from 2021. Well, you know, that's, that it's in, or we are getting it from 2021, but, but sometimes we get statistics that aren't as uh, up to date as, as we would like. But in this case, we're getting them so up to date that we couldn't compare one to the other. You know. Anything else? No, I'll follow up with the department to get that data that you asked for. Um, one thing that the committee might want to consider is having a briefing on the fire department's preventive prevention efforts. They have a yeah, whole unit that good. does that work, and it could be very helpful to also get out the word of some of these um, public service announcements closed before you does as well. No, I think that's an extremely good idea, and I and, and I believe that they deserve that they can be the first on the list rather than have to be. I mean, they certainly could, could, uh, could stay and watch anything else we're discussing, but I don't know that it's necessarily as fair that, that they had to wait all morning. Go ahead. Thank you for that suggestion. That's a great idea. Um, while I have you here, I wanted to note also, and this is on the uh, kind of resource, you know, conservation side, and uh, but this is in regards to not just preventing fires, but preventing the, uh, the false alarms and the calls that you get. Um, I know at the Enclave, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of pulling of the of the firearm alarm there. Uh, I know that they have also in recent years that ownership there has. Uh, taking the concierge desks out. There used to be 24-hour concierges sitting there. Um, now not only are there not concierges inside, uh, they've taken the desks out entirely. There's no supervision at all, and the locks are routinely broken um, to the front doors, to all the doors, really. Uh, and so um, I'll connect with you on this later to, to just talk in more detail, but I think, you know, again, part of the answer here is that there's response, there needs to be responsibilities by ownership and by landlords to put in place the things that are going to help mitigate, uh, reduce those behaviors, um, but would be interested in connecting with you to maybe um, look at look at numbers around when those concierge deaths, for example, came out and the pulling of the fire alarm, um, which I know has happened a lot, happens a lot in many places, but I know it's at a really ridiculous pace right now, and I just hate to think about all of the wasted time. Um, and um, and and what we could do on the uh, on the community side with um, not just education, um, but with you know connecting and gaining investment from them and, and so on. Okay. So so to your point, it was exactly those numbers that brought us to the enclave. Mm -hmm. So we had the fire that was almost a double fatal. Right. Um, those two, I think, are still hospitalized. Yeah. So it's uh, one has recently emerged from a coma, which is. So okay. we went. We went to look. Like what? You know what? What is this? And when we started pulling numbers, like oh my, oh my God! So it goes back to that notion that can notice. How is it that this complex was responsible for this disproportionate level of service calls, without us catching on to it until two people almost died? So we're working. Right? Like, how do we put sensors out there? How do we put boundaries about how do you end up on the trouble list or whatever? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we've been out there, but I think there are things that happen that people don't know. So, like, the fire alarm systems there are shaky, right? It's the fire department works with our DPS partners. I know DPS has been, and DHCA too. Have been pulling their hair out working like overtime on these problems. Mm -hmm. We've made some adjustments um, in how we respond to high rise fires. We've deployed, bought, and deployed new equipment uh, to give us options in case some of those systems fail. It is hard for the fire department to recover from a failed system on the 18th floor of an occupied building when the thing's on fire. It is hard enough to put those fires out when everything works as planned. So again, we, re we, we reiterate and remain committed to getting in and figuring stuff out, not just superficially knocking on doors and hanging hangers, but committing the resources, because this, this group that's looking into the enclave includes HHS, DHCA, 
DPS, Fire Rescue, and MCPD, even though they have only been playing a supportive role for obvious reasons. But every time something happens on oh, the regional service director, like that dude is amazing. Mm -hmm. And if a fire extinguisher goes off in a hallway, I'm getting a text like three minutes later. I'm like, can you wait until the fire trucks get there, <laughs> right? That is how connected he is to those things. And we are riding along on that connectivity. What I need people to realize is two things. There is an upper limit to our capability, and there is this residual risk that the fire department cannot cover for, even if you were willing to pay. And number two, the absolute critical of importance in building uh, that resilience on the front end, and that equation for resilience includes education and preparation, and that I want to last, at the last thing I'll say is I want to reiterate the jointness of this all. I've talked to you about all the other county agencies. The volunteers in Montgomery County have been deeply in and this Mr. space. Mr. Bernard is here as well. They are out there delivering Stop the Bleed. They are out there doing home safety checks. They are out there on the Potomac River doing awareness. And this is in addition to the response roles that they fill, right? Everybody in this organization is committed. So that community action coordinator was not about supplementing or supplanting what they were doing in that space. It was coordination and yeah. getting them the yeah. resources they need to continue their work. So with that said, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are we, are we good, Susan? And as well, good. Thank you very much. Thank you all for doing everything that you're doing, and we are adjourned. Thanks.